My name is Rhiannon Giddens, and I am Black in America. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Black in America. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing a wonderful, phenomenal artist that has a very fascinating background and a name that sometimes people mispronounce unless you ask her, how do you say this? And she says it's Rhiannon, like Shannon. And I have this wonderful, amazing artist with me today. Rhiannon, how are you doing, my friend? Um, you know, I'm doing pandemic okay. Like, you know, it's like, you never know. <laughs> Never know what to answer, but it's kind of of like, you know, not bad, but not exactly where I want to be. But, you know, life is good for the most part. So (laughs) I love that. I've never had that answer before yet today. Pandemic. okay, you know, I'm pandemic. okay. that's exactly (laughs) right. We're doing the best with what we have and thankful Mm -hmm. for what still remains. You know, Exactly. exactly, exactly. Well, again, welcome to this episode of Black in America. Very excited to have you. And we just want to again, have a conversation, getting to know you, learning about your experience of being Black in America. So I start this session off in every interview and I ask this one question, open-ended question that I really want uh, you to kind of focus on too. Talk to us about what does it mean for you and what did it mean for you growing up Black in America? Um, It was confusing. It was very confusing for me because I'm I'm mixed, you know, so there's already a dual thing going on. Um, I have white family, I have black family. Um, so on the one hand, I know that I'm mixed because like I see the my dad and my, <laughs> my, my grandparents and my, my cousins. But on the other hand, you know, I'm, I know that I'm considered black because of the history of race in, in our country. But on the other hand, to the black community, I'm not quite there, you know, because I also just have very ambiguous features in terms of, Mm. you know, I got asked a lot, what was I? I don't really look like a traditional mix, if you know what I mean? Like, and just all, it all was very confusing. And then of course, to the white people, I was obviously other. Um, And so I didn't really know where I, where I fit in. I didn't understand any of these things. And so my my growing up period was very I just every time I looked in the mirror I was I was asking myself the question everybody else was asking me which is what am I you know uh, and uh, I'm, I'm in North Carolina you, hmm? which side no I'm just saying which side of your family was black or, and, and white your mother your father so my mom my mom's side is black and also white and also native you know kind of a typical mutt sort of <laughs> southern <laughs> mix you know <laughs> yes, yes yes and then my dad's side was white and like everybody working class. You know what I mean? Okay. So everybody, everybody rural based, my parents met in a small city at a university, hippies, you know, that kind of thing. Three yeah. years, three years after it was legal, you know, that kind of stuff. And so it was just like me growing up, I was like, yeah, I was confused a lot. And it mm-hmm. really the music, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but it was my discovery of the music of North Carolina and sort of what became my life's mission is what helped me figure out my identity. Oh wow! Let's let's go there right now. Say more about that. How? Because you were you grew up in North Carolina, the South. Is that what I'm gathering? Okay. So talk to me about that scene because you're right. Very different than growing up in the Northeast, or, uh, Midwest, right? At, during that time. So talk to me about how music was that influence and helped you through that process. <clears throat> well, it's so interesting because like you know I'm in the Piedmont, right? So Greensboro and the surrounding kind of rural area. Like I spent the first part of my life in the country with my grandparents. And then, you know, I was always kind of going back and forth. And Greensboro is actually a, a quite a diverse city. So there's, a, there's a lot of black people, there's a lot of brown people. And then there's, you know, obviously there's white people. And so I kind of got used to that mix. And then I was also getting like bluegrass music, you know, from my dad's side of the family. But then also my black grandmother was watching Hee Haw every Saturday night. You know what I mean? Like all these kind of mixed signals, like according to, you know, contrasting to what the the narrative was, which was, you know, these kind of people listen to this and these kind of people listen to this. I was growing up with these kind of mixed signals, which I come to realize later are the truth. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So. I, I kind of just had that sort of always in the background. And then, you know, I went off to school and I studied opera, kind of ran away from all of it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and got immersed into the, you know, Western art music. But then when I came back to North Carolina, you know, and I discovered 
like old time music. I discovered f- like the music that like bluegrass and and the '60s folk movement stuff was based on, which is that root yeah. stuff. Like we're talking yeah. way back, right? And I discovered the banjo, and I was like, I only heard like bluegrass style banjo, and I heard this old claw hammer like funky. Yeah. Thing. And I was like, what is that? And then, you know, I got all into it. And then I realized, you know, through various, you know, modes that it was African American instrument. I was like, what? Mm. Mm. And that was it. Like the, the, that, you know, you can look back in your life and you go, we're at a crossroads. Mm-hmm. Right. That mm-hmm. was a crossroads for me. I was kind of barreling this way. And then I hit that and I was like, I'm going wow. this way. Because, you know, finding out it had been a black instrument for you know a couple hundred years, like a long time, right? Yes. Finding that out, I went like, okay, so how do I not know this? And then it very quickly became, why? Yeah, don't we yeah. know this? And that's when I kind of really started getting into the vast sort of, I mean, you don't want to say conspiracy, but it really was a concerted effort yes. to falsify the cultural narrative of our music, you know, yeah. and. In, dis- in discovering, you know, that I also discovered uh, Joe Thompson, who was like an elder from the black community who was still playing this music. Mm. Like he like grew up in a family band, the Thompson family band. He was a fiddle player mm-hmm. and he was living in my family's hometown of Mebane. Like my mom's side was from Mebane. I used to go down there for family reunions every year. Didn't know this guy was there until I was, you know, a lot older. And he's in his 80s, he's 83. And he played, he, his daddy played fiddle. Like you can trace his musical lineage back to slavery. Like it has been done. Like, a, you know, scholar, the scholarship has been done. And I apprent- basically me and the other original members of my first band, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, apprenticed with him. And we mm. would go and we sit in his living room and we would play his music and like learn his family tradition. And it was like to have an elder from the black community as close to my family as you could possibly get without being in his family. And we have people in our family tree that are, you know, we're all related, you know? Yes, yes. And it was like, to have that experience, like changed my whole life. Like it it just, it it brought meaning to what I was doing as a musician and it brought me, oh, I know who I am. Okay. Right, because like, the Thompson family, man, they play for the white dances. They play for the black dances. This was just music, mm. right? Mm. And so as I saw it in the music, I was like, actually, this is regional, right? Mm. Music is regional. And it's like, these people are playing it. And then these people are playing it. And there's different groups that brought different things to the table. But once it gets mixed up, everybody's playing the same stuff. That's right. And, and it kind of got me into my, my realization of, oh, I'm North Carolinian. That's what I am. Black, white, red, whatever is up here. Yeah. I'm right. My experience is North Carolina, and North Carolina is a Creole experience, you know? And so I saw it in the music first, and it helped me accept kind of, you know, or find what that meant for me, like as a person. Yes. So yes that was really long. Yeah. No, that was, <laughs> listen, that was brilliant. It, it helped you, the music was a path and a guide that helped you settle into your identity is what I'm understanding you to say, right? Exactly. Phenomenal mm-hmm. and gave you the language and also the freedom to mm-hmm. feel and to express and to enjoy and engage all of these wonderful, diverse sounds. And, and right, it, it gave you that permission to say, that's North Carolinian, that, that's who you are. Yeah. We're all yeah. of this, not this or that, it's this and that. Is that what I gather? Exactly, yeah. Absolutely amazing. You said something. I want to go back because you said so many wonderful things. So opera, first of all, where did you go to college and why was <laughs> and why was opera on your mind? I mean, you were in North Carolina in the South. You got this thing going on with am I black? Am I white? Who am I? And but opera, like how did we get there? Well, and it even gets a little bit more complicated. I was at a math science boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like. I was a nerd, actually, at that moment. 
Yeah, I still am, really. Um, okay. It's not something you, you, okay. not something okay. you out, bro. <laughs> you, you never do it. Life you never do. But I was going to the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, which is a, it's a you know, it's a boarding school. And I just, while I was there, I discovered, actually, I want to sing for a living. This is what I want to do. And I had already, I'd always. How did sing. you, hold on, you're moving too fast. How did you discover you wanted to sing? Where did you know I, you could sing? Well, I I grew up singing like, you know, the family story. I'm like singing in the crib. I'm like making up songs, you know, but I just sang with my sister. I sang with my dad. My dad was a voice major who ended up not, you know, pursuing music. So I had music in my family, like three part harmony at Christmas, you know, that kind of stuff. It It was just part of my life. You know, okay, and like right. my, my parents would never let us like enter these contests where we'd go, you know, try to sing Whitney Houston or something. They would never let us do that. Okay. You know, didn't take voice lessons, just kind of let I they put me in a choir, which was great. A youth choir, you know, okay. learn how to yes, yes, yes. stand up, and sing with people. And yeah. okay. it's kind of like it was just part of me. But then I went to this uh, summer camp. I'm a real product of North Carolina. Right. Because like the boarding school was free. It's tax paid. Mm-hmm. Like you had to apply to get in. But once you once you got in, it was taken care of. And there was another thing called governor school, which was a summer program. Again, if you applied to get in, it didn't cost anything. And now I went for a choral camp, you know, a governor school. And I was like, I found my people. Oh, my God. You know, I want to sing opera. I didn't know nothing about opera. I was like, <laughs> was so you found, opera, you found your people. Something about it resonated with you. Well, it was like I found I found like a choral people, like the musical theater people. And then I started listening to some like opera, you know, like a, a CD with a bunch of different arias on it. Right. Like okay. I bought me a couple. And then I was thinking about going to school for music. And I was like, musical theater, they speak on stage. Opera, they just sing. I want to do opera. Like that was okay. literally my decision because I didn't want to have to talk. And I, I don't know, I thought it was beautiful and I'm listening to it. And and so like, I went to Oberlin Conservatory for opera. Yes. You know? And wow. yeah, I did a bunch of operas and I was like mad into it. That's all I did was listen to, breathe, drink, sleep, eat. All my jobs had to do with opera. Like I'm doing the opera website, I'm writing, you know, I'm like, it's crazy. And then I burn out, I burn the heck out, you know, yeah. okay. as you do. And I mean, I had to learn how to read music. I didn't know anything. Right. You know, right. And it was intense. It was really intense. And, you know, it's not the most supportive atmosphere for people of color either, you know, so mm-hmm. there's a lot. And then there was a lot of rich people, students, yeah. you know, yeah. it was like, yeah. 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 there's a lot of stuff. It was in the north, you know, yes. 40 <laughs> minutes from Cleveland, you know. Well, listen, I know we're over there. I'm from Ohio. So okay. I know. Where you're at. Yeah, yeah, I'm from the good old Midwest. So I know where you're at. You Maybe know. It's cool, though. But yes, it's, it is not North Carolina. <laughs> no, no. Oh, man. It was, yeah, transition. But um, yeah, and then when I, I burned out and I was kind of like, I remember thinking, like, what am I offering? I mean, because I did well. Like, I got main roles. Like, pe- you know, people were like, okay, you're on the path. Yes. So having a chance, you know? And I just went, but what am I doing that like a bunch of other, there's like a million sopranos out there. You know, mm. what am I doing that's contributing to this in a way that is meaningful? Mm-hmm. You know, I was really thinking that. I was like, cause you've got to commit 150% if you want to sing opera, you know? And I wasn't yeah. sure I wanted to do that. So I went back home and I discovered, you know, folk dancing, contra dancing. Uh, that's how I found the banjo. You know, I'm such a nerd. I'm a, I'm I'm raising in the oatmeal wherever I go. It's <laughs> you know? so like I was like you know into this contra and square dancing. I freaking fell in love, and the music was all this old time music. I started learning how to call dances, all this stuff, and then I started finding out about the banjo. Right? Yes. People were telling me, oh well, you know, Bob was like, what? Got this book? What? And then there was this other guy. Phil Jameson, and he's a researcher, and he was like, well, you know, black people probably invented square dance calling. I was like, <laughs> what? 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 You know, because he's, he's, he spent 10 years writing this book about the roots of Appalachian dance, and, and it's yeah. like, he's like, yeah. And I was like, so I'm actually doing a thing that we've been doing yeah. for, and he's like, yeah. A long time, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, that experience of feeling like an outsider Yes. Feeling like I had to ask permission to be there, mm-hmm. feeling like mm-hmm. 
being mistaken for the other black girl who, who used to come sometimes all the time. You know, that, ex- that experience of constant mm-hmm. othering, constant alienation, yes. and discovering that we created this stuff. I was like, yeah. I'm, this is, it was messing with my brain. I was like, this is, it was exciting, but it was also infuriating. I was like, how did this happen? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's kind of trying to answer that question has been, you know, was the next 15 years. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but you know what? That is wonderful. I mean, it's it's so such these full circle moments for you and your experience that I'm discovering how music has truly been that guiding light and force and 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 and, and force of enlightenment rather for you in so many ways. And and you being the nerd that you say you are self-proclaimed nerd, the historian, you're digging in, you're doing your homework and your research in every area. It seems like you completely immerse yourself in whatever you're doing. And so therefore you must get to the bottom. And so I think that's been beneficial because in that work, you've discovered the roots and the history of all this wonderful stuff. Back to the banjo, understanding and even country music, right? What do they say is America's music? Isn't it country music? Like is America's music or something, right? But understand the origins and history of that are very black, right? And we, and we don't hear that. We don't talk about that, you know? And so, like you said, I love how you put that. You're in a constant space of being the other. And there, and so that, that to me is kind of what I'm gathering. You were confused and you felt as if you were always the other. And that was your experience growing up as black in America, right? And, and until you found music and or music found you, however we want to put it, but it put you on a path to self-discovery. And then yeah. you settled into that. So then you made some other major moves. So now I'm loving this fascinating story. Mix uh, heritage. Uh, and then she's in North Carolina. She comes up to my state of Ohio to go to be an opera singer after she was a math major and science person in a boarding school. But then what happens? She has to shake it up some more. And so you decide, you know what? I'm going to pull up and I'm moving to Ireland. Talk to me. <laughs> Like, I didn't shake this shit up enough, right? I, nah, it's not enough. So this did not give me what I'm looking for. So now you have to tell me why Ireland, right? And you went there, you know, as a black musician. So how was it for you there as a black musician in Ireland? And you just lived experience as a black woman there. And talk to me about why you even chose Ireland. Well, it's very interesting because it kind of go. You have to. We have to go back to even before the banjo. When I when I left Oberlin, I um, made some discoveries about. I got. I I joined a Celtic band. You know, because my name is Welsh. Rhiannon is a Welsh name, or the Rhiannon is a Welsh name. Comes from Welsh mythology. So I've always been aware of sort of the Celtic. I mean, Celtic is such a terrible term, but the the idea of you know the islands and some of the cultures over there. It's always been kind of over here. And so I fell into um, this Celtic band, and then I started making this discovery about, I started hearing um, Gaelic music, which is, you know, Scots Gaelic is what they speak in Scotland, in the Highlands and Islands, what they used to speak all over, but then of course the English, it's, colonialism does not start with America, right? (laughs) Like the English practiced on their own savages, quote unquote, the the Irish, the, the the Gaelic speakers of Scotland and the Welsh, and in, you know all of that push the people got pushed back pushed on the fringes the language is very similar to the to what they then use on browner people elsewhere right so it was really interesting to me to start finding out this history you know because like to us it's like oh yeah scotland they all wear you know kilts and bagpipes and it's like it's very it's very interesting and it's very there's they're very distinct cultures and I heard walking songs, which is, you know, the songs that they sing while filling the cloth. It made me think of the powwow music that I'd been learning when I was in high school and I was doing some mm-hmm. of that. And it was really making me think. And then I, I kind of, and then I fell into, um, I, I fell in when, when this guy who's a Gaelic speaker and, a, and, a, and an academic, and he was saying, well, you know, there were black Gaelic speakers in North Carolina. I was like, what? Mm. Like black people speaking Scots Gaelic and considering themselves Gales. Like they had to send off for a Gaelic preacher for this black church in North Carolina, right? Because they were all Gaelic speakers and they wanted to hear the service in Gaelic. And I was just like, it blew my mind in terms of what is the black experience? Yes. Not monolithic, right? And it never was. Sojourner Truth had a Dutch accent, yo. It's like, Mm. we are all these layers of things. And that was my first exposure into the idea of race as a construct, you know, yes. a construct used on people who look just like them first. 
Yes. Yes. Right? And then it was combined with all this, you know, all the stuff that was already being formed in Africa with the Arabic slave trade and all that stuff. I mean, it's like all of these strands coming into, you know, form this extraordinarily toxic brand of, you know, our peculiar racism. Mm-hmm. But it was like discovering what had happened over there first was really fascinating. And then the idea of a language, a culture is what makes you a group, right? Mm-hmm. Is what yes. you know, and that's that's what we pull from, and and then we've been putting race on top of that, and that just screws everything up. So that whole idea of black people speaking Gaelic, I was like, oh my god, you know, and the whole idea that when black people got over here, they had their own history, and then they had this whole other thing that they had to contend with, and we've con- we've compressed all of that into this one idea of what it meant to be black in like 1785 or 1823. You know, it's like. So that was the beginning of my sort of, you know, kind of realization there. So fast forward a few, you know, a decade or whatever, and I meet, you know, my eventual husband and eventual ex husband, mother, father of my children, and he's <laughs> Irish. Um, and he's a lovely guy, lovely, lovely guy from Limerick. And, um, you know, we get together and we have a couple of kids, and then we kind of make this decision. Um, where do we want to raise them? You know, it's like we've been on the road with the kids or they're getting to the age where we need to put them in school. And I was like, I was very encouraging of him to use Irish. Like in Ireland, Irish Gaelic is a minority language. It's been, you know, the English tried to stamp it out so hard, you know, and it's surviving and now they've kind of made it part of their schooling system, but it's still, there's a lot of shame around it and it's really complicated Mm -hmm. and they all learn it in school, but they don't necessarily really learn how to use it. And there's still some native speakers and it's really complicated. And I said to him, like, why don't you speak Irish to the baby? Like when our first child was born, I was like, I don't know what my ancestor spoke. You do. That's right. And you speak it. Like maybe you're not fluent, but like it's a baby. Right. You don't have to, like, make a speech to the baby, <laughs> like, you know, you can grow with the baby, you know. And so he did it. God bless him. He did it and did it with our son and then was like, well, let's put him in a school where they can learn everything through Irish. And it, and it really becomes a spoken language for them. And so that's why we moved to Ireland. So now they're in they're in school through Irish there. It's called they're called Gale Skulls. And I've seen like now his sister started having kids and she saw how cool it was to hear the baby like speak back in Irish. And so she's now raising her kids in Irish. And it's like this little brown girl from North Carolina just like affected this whole family. And that's why it's so great to be an outsider coming in. That's why it's so important to meet people from different backgrounds because you have a perspective. Like I came in as an outsider going, Irish is valuable, Mm. right? Because you look at my history, like, We've lost, we've, we have a lot, like black culture is like, we are amazing at what we have made for ourselves and how we have survived. But there are things that we've lost. And I'm like, you haven't lost this yet, you know? So, and I just, you know, and I, I go over there and I see it and I hear him speaking it, you know, and it's just like, it's really cool. It's really cool. So yeah, that's why I do. It makes sense. So you were intentional. I mean, what I hear now, you're like, you know what? What I had to live through of not knowing, number one, living this life in that tension of being otherized and confused, there's an opportunity for me to actually safeguard my children from that and make sure they are firmly rooted in who they are. There's an opportunity for them to know this and to be proud of it Mm -hmm. and for it to be affirmed. And you made that decision to say, you know what? Ireland, here we come, here we come. We're gonna make sure that happens. That's powerful and beautiful. I love the little fun fact you sprinkled in there when you're going on, on, on answering that question about Sojourner Truth. Didn't know she had a Dutch accent. I was like, bing. I'm just like parking little things in my mind. Like she's dropping all these nuggets. You are truly, truly a self-identified and I can affirm it. You are a nerdy. You are 100%. I love that. I love that. And so it was clear to me what's emerged in listening to you that your love for music, right? This beautiful, diverse set of music, country, blues, folk music, clearly that was developed in that North Carolina space where you grew up at. And that was all cooked there and you were trying to understand and it was guiding you and forming you and fashioning you, right? And so to your playlist that we that you curated, <clears throat> let me jump into that for a moment. You chose to showcase Memphis Minis 
if you see my rooster last year on the blue show with uh now i'm gonna uh, the last name is matthews who was pronounced the first name so i don't slaughter you know i'm all about getting these names right oh lord um i think it's C E R Y S. It's a Welsh name, I believe. Um, okay. Well, you know what? I don't feel so bad that I, at least I paused and you're like, ah. So I think yeah. it's Harris, but I, yeah. I'm not 100% sure because it's been a while. Hey, it's cool. But yeah. So that's fine. But uh, Miss Nat Matthews, how do you navigate, you know, uh, continuing her legacy in blues music as a black woman? And then what is that song? How did that make the list? Why did that make the list, rather? And what's it mean to you? Well, Memphis Minnie is, she's somebody who's not as well known as she should be, okay. you know, uh, women instrumentalists in general don't get, don't get the play they should, you know, mm -hmm. um, when you look at somebody like Sister Rosetta Tharp, who was like, yes. <laughs> a genius. <laughs> <laughs> no, she came straight out of the church too. You could tell she was churched. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Read her, read her biography. Really interesting. Um, Very yeah. But, but it's like she was so influential she was like yeah. so famous in her time and you go right what happens to them you know why do they get it's, it's because who do we choose to hold up who do we choose to remember right, right? right. we're always making our history as we go mm -hmm. and and who we are talking about is not necessarily the people always the people that we should be talking about so anyway right. memphis Minnie is just a cool I, she's just a cool cat man and i i, I picked her as an example because you know she's an instrumentalist She's, you know, a great singer, but also it's like that brand of female empowerment through blues of talking about the men, you know, and it's like, yes, yes, there's a there's this strand of just like, you know, having to figure out how to how to exist in a world where you were manish by white people. You were too, you know, then you were too manish by black men because they were expected to take this Victorian you know, mm -hmm. head of the household. Whereas like as a black woman, you were expected to work from jump like for hundreds of years. So it's kind of like, you see it play out in the blues all the time. Like this, this figuring out how to be in a relationship and to have all these expectations put upon you. And how do you find that, that way through anyway? <laughs> it's a long answer to it. It's a cool song. <laughs> By a cool lady, you know, but the answers are great. They're not too long. This is what we're looking for. I mean, your everything is clearly thoughtful and intentional. You always have these great backstories, and so the reason for her again recapping that is like, you know, Maurice, I want to shine some light on some of these, most of these women who have been artists and amazing that didn't get the proper shine that they deserve to have, and this is another example of that. Yeah. I, I totally get it, and her story is fascinating, and I appreciate learning something about her and her music today. Um, and switching gears, you know, changing genres a little bit to a person I really admire her music and love, India Ari. Oh. Uh, right? Shared the stage with you in American Songbook in 2017. Would you mind elaborating on your relationship with India and your decision to include her song, Brown Skin? Oh, in your man. I, I wish I had a relationship with India. I mean, I wish I knew her. I'd love to work with her someday. I think that. She, I loved her intentionality with what she's done with her career. Um, I love, I love that album so much, the whole record that Brown Skin's from. And I just love the celebration of us, you know, mm -hmm. the celebration mm -hmm. of um, our uniqueness and kind of just lauding that. And, and just reveling in it. And it's like, I don't really care if it's for you or if you, you're listening to it, but like, I know who's listening to it and that's who I'm talking to, you know? And there's just kind of, there's a sheer uh, unabashedness in that, which I just, I was really taken by, you know? And I, you know, I love video um, on that, you know, just that whole idea of in an, in an industry, I mean, I, I was able to kind of get by without buying into the beauty industry because I'm a folk singer. So mm -hmm. I can be barefooted. I can be a little bit rougher on the edges. You know what I'm saying? And I have been <laughs> quite a lot. But like she kind of took that bull by the horns in an industry where that's not easy. You know, R&B, New Soul, whatever you want to call it. Like that stuff is enforced there. And like, so, you know, all of that was is one of the things that makes me really admire her. And plus, yeah. she's just banging like 
it, um, playing the guitar, you know, singing. Uh, yeah. Yes, man. Doesn't she just make your soul feel good every time she approaches? It's just she is totally soul food. You know what I mean? Like everything about her warms your soul, affirms who you are as a person. She, it's a great big hug. She's wrapping love around you every time she hits the stage. I agree with you. Um, yeah, so powerful, powerful. And that song, Brown Skin, is one of my favorites, too. Okay. You also highlighted some household names, you know, across, across genres in your playlist, such as Queen Latifah and Aretha Franklin with Unity and Dr. Feelgood, right? Love is serious business. Mm -hmm. How did you hear about the, how did you hear about the success of Black women in music? And how did that encourage you on your musical path? So I want you first to unpack, why did you pick those folks, Queen Latifah and Aretha, and those songs, if, 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 you, if, you, know, if you could share a little bit about that, but how did that, hearing about these black successful women encourage you on your musical path? <clears throat> Yeah, it was really, you know, this playlist was really fun for me to put together because I didn't have, I could just put what I wanted. Yep. I mean, I always put what I want, but I'm always having an eye for, you know, like the Memphis Minis of the world, which is really kind of the eye for shining a light and yep. educating. Whereas yep. this was just like people that have affected me, you know, yes. in, my, yep. in my path. And so, you know, Queen Latifah was like the first rap record that I really, I don't listen to a lot of rap. I have a hard, I actually have a really hard time distinguishing words, even when people are singing. So it's not a great genre for me because I'm literally one of those people looking at the liner notes going, what is that? What, what did they say? <laughs> you know, I hear the, the tones and the music before I hear the words, you know, and then I sit with the words and then it's like, and then it's complete for me. But she, I don't know. I really loved her again, her message of even in that song of like, we got to quit this separation we got to quit fighting each other and the, the idea of um you know her strong her strength and you know that's it's kind of a it's a common thread and you know also with that song i remember very very clearly i was in high school and i had it playing in my room and like two black girls who were on my hall this was in my boarding class my boarding school came by and it's like just because you listen to queen latifah doesn't mean you black and they just kept walking. And it's that kind of stuff that, you know, well, you remember forever. And also, I, you know, I've, I've had to struggle with that most of my life, which is like not black enough for black people, obviously not white and other for white people. And it's just like, what do you want from me? You know, it's like, I feel like I have fought for our history and our culture mm. my entire career. And yet there's so many Anyway, I just like, I, I can't, it, it's, it's frustrating. And that kind of represents that for me. It's just like, I just like the song. That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's right, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that kind of represents that for me. And also Aretha Franklin is just one of the best singers in the entire world, <laughs> past and present. Period, right, right. You know, and her on that song in particular, she's playing that piano, which a lot of people don't give her the cred for the piano playing, right? This is a constant, this is a constant thread in not just women musicians, but black women musicians is that when they play an instrument, they don't get props for that. And I'm just like, she's a heck of a, she was a heck of a piano player, but also again, that taking, taking the control in the bedroom, <laughs> you know, that kind of like, I just love that about us, you know, in, in these genres of music. And I found, I just find so much beauty in that. I love that. So I am noticing a theme, right? So. You have India Ari, then you go to um, Queen Latifah, and then we have the powerful Aretha Franklin. And what I'm hearing too is what they spoke to you. They all were extremely talented, gifted women, but they were strong, unique, independent women. Like mm -hmm. you could tell they, le they lead their lives, right? And, and take control of it and will not be put in a box. Queen Latifah clearly broke outside the box with what she was doing, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, India Ari totally said, you know what, I'm gonna approach this R&B from this standpoint, right? And she, you know, and broke outside the box. And Aretha to her, to her own, in her own way too. You know, so I, I see what you're saying. You really like that and it resonated with you, that self-empowerment and seeing black women leading their lives unapologetically the way they wanted to. Yeah. Right. Uh, and as and as you want to barefooted at times singing your folk music, you know, you wanted that they were feeding that liberation and that empowerment to just be yourself is what I'm gathering. It's really it's really wonderful. Um, you said something about that story, though. That is that is 
I heard you, and, I, and, and that is something about being black in America, your school experience, and then walking by the dorm, and while you're playing Queen Latifah and saying, doesn't matter if you're playing her or not, you still won't be black. And as you said, that is seared into your mind. That moment is, is you know, and that's, that's, that's tough um, because it is <laughs> this constant, which is rooted in ignorance, the statement itself, right? <laughs> rooted in ignorance. And, and, and it, still, it, it still props up its ugly head in so many ways today of who's black, who's not black, what's black enough, what's the appropriate black, what's the, you know, it's all, you know, right? It's all of this shit that's still going on that we have to work through and uh, continue to resist and, and fight against. So I totally, I totally hear you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Vera Ward, Vera Ward Halls, mm -hmm. Trouble So Hard, bring us back to black history throughout the centuries and the pain, suffering, and inequality we face and continue to fight. First of all, I want to know, in your opinion, why did she make this list? But what emotions does this song evoke for you when, when you listen to it? Um, it really connects me to when I found like roots music like this, you know, like Vera Ward Hall, like, um, and and some of the stuff that Lomax captured, some of the stuff other people captured. I mean, there's there's if you look, it's out there, and it's not a lot of it, but there's enough. You know, um, it. You know, the more that I heard that and studied that, the more I understood like my grandparents. You know, I hear mm -hmm. vocal inflections that I heard my grandmother. You know, who I lived with when I was young, um, as she would go around the kitchen singing. You know, mm -hmm. and there's a connection. Then when I sing that kind of thing, you know, I'm feel like I connect then to my grandmother and her life. Yes. You know. And so it's a very visceral thing. And I just think it's really important to not forget that. And also the idea of domestic music making often gets forgotten. We always talk about the people who went and made a living, you know, who got on stage, you know, who are professional music makers, the Bessie Smiths, the, you know, the Sister Rosetta Tharps, the Rita Franklins, but there were so many women who made music in the home mm. and affected generations of people who then did go out. A lot of men who went out you know, mm -hmm. and, were, and became professional musicians, but they grew up hearing their mothers play the banjo, hearing their mothers sing, hearing their mothers play, you know, the guitar. Um, and it's just like, she kind of represents that because her style of singing is not performative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, um, oh, Lord, am I trouble so hard. It's just, she's singing. She's living. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I get goosebumps when I do I that. I did too like, when you did that. Yes, yes, yeah. You know, yeah and, wow. and I just think that's an important piece to never forget, you know, mm -hmm. that that is a huge portion of who we are. Is yes. That we had to make music in the home. We had to have our space, you know, mm -hmm. like when we weren't, even when musicians were, were like that vast black string band tradition where they're, you know, you got to go play for the big house. You got to play for this party, you're playing for this function. You are a function band. But when you go back home, is yeah. mama, mama singing. Right. You right. know? And I just think she's a really, really important representation of that. Wow. Wow. How powerful. I didn't even think of that until you you did the little riff in the song and I felt exactly what you felt and it transported me back my mind to my own grandmother singing. Uh, she's still alive, thank God, 83. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it's that domestic singing that's so powerful and transformative and soothing. Mm -hmm. it, it has so much distress and pain, but it also has strength and resilience in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also a spirituality in it for me that is just, just something you can't even explain mm -hmm. um, that you just you just shared. And I think that's so true. And that is right. We often forget about, I like how you coined it, the domestic musician that, you know, we don't raise them up. But those were oftentimes the ones that propelled those other artists mm -hmm. to get to where they arrived at. Oh, I'm so glad you shared this song and told us about that. That was that was great. That was great. Um, Thinking about now transitioning a little bit, going back to a couple of other things here, you, your performance in American Songbook 20, uh, 2017, you sang a cover of Ethel Waters' uh, No Man's uh, Mama, which I see is also in your playlist, and another blues classic, Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out. Mm -hmm. uh, Alberta Hunter is on here. So 
again, tell me about those songs and how do you feel <clears throat> when you sing works from black musicians who paved the way in this particular area? Like, what is that? How does that connect to you? So talk to me about how those songs made the list. <clears throat> um, well, Ethel Waters is, I mean, they're both incredibly important and very different. Their lives are very different. Ethel Waters and Alberta Hunter. Um, and I, you know, I read about these women. I want to know about their lives. And the more I learn about their lives, the more their music comes alive to me, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, No Man's Mom is just a killer. It's a killer song. Uh, it's, it's so great. But one of the ones of hers, I didn't include because she didn't, she never recorded it. Um, yeah. it's only in a, it's only in a film is called Underneath the Harlem Moon. And it's mm -hmm. like, when I went and discovered all the changes and things that she'd done to this song, I just discovered a whole side I mean, is Harlem. Mm. Like you take that song, you break it down and you can write a whole essay on Harlem and what it was like at that time. And so this music is a window into black life at a certain place in a certain time. And these people, you know, are, are representing that, you know, so somebody like Ethel Waters who like was a star, a huge star. And mm. she's not as well known now as, as, you know, again, as she, sh as she should be, you know, first singer of stormy weather, like, you mm -hmm. know, amazing stuff and just her even her sound quality is very different to say like somebody like bessie smith but that was still considered she was a black singer you know it's also this idea of we had a lot of different quivers in our in our, in our to our bow you know we we weren't just one a one trick pony like and that's you know people keep trying to force black sound into this stereotypical bucket and it's just like no we got all the buckets <laughs> like we all, all the buckets all of it <laughs> and, and then you take alberta hunter and she's somebody who if you look at like when she started in the 20s you know she's very well known she was one of those she actually got royalties for her song she's very very smart she was a lesbian but it was never something that she was very public about but again mm -hmm. these women because they had to already break a lot of walls down to just do what they were doing they had mm. they were able to live a more authentic life than mm. i think a lot of other women at that time and that's why you see i mean you see that again and again people who are you know have women as lovers who have men you know have both who have they live in their lives because they've, they're like they've already had to do all this just to even get in the game so they're like i might as well live my life you know and i just think there's something that's really beautiful in that and then you take alberta hunter who like she had a career and then taste changed. She was, you know, kind of like looking at the crossroads. Do I quit trying to do this? And then her mom got sick or something. And then she decided I'm gonna be a nurse. Mm. She lied about her age, said she was younger than she was, trained to be a nurse, worked 30 years. They made her retire. She was already past retirement age, but nobody knew. And wow. then she was rediscovered and she started going on tour in her eighties. And so she recorded this, you know, uh, on Amtrak Blue. She was on the other side of her life. And to to hear it in the beginning and then to hear yes. and you hear every all of her lived experience mm. in that song is it's so beautiful. Like there's video, there's film of her, which is amazing. She's got a hair scraped back. She's wearing a simple dress and she's just herself. And, you know, yeah. you could just see everything that she in people at the, the hospital she worked with didn't have any idea she was a singer. Unbelievable. You know, I, I mean, the journey, the story. Okay. I love that you you mined all the dug and you did your research and have all this beautiful context for this because I didn't know anything about these stories. This is just phenomenal, right? And that and that's and that's again back to your point earlier. You can't try to put us in any bucket. We're not a monolith because our stories and our journeys are so vast and so beautiful and so diverse and so broad. Uh, and incredible. Thinking about that with one more artist here, I see Nina Simone made the list, right? And, you know, Nina was also an awesome out of the box. You couldn't take the certain path. Classically trained pianist was denied entrance into the uh, school once they found out she was black. And that, I think that always scarred Nina. That Nina never got over that. Uh, uh, but I see the song uh, For Women, uh, F-O-U-R, For Women, is a work clearly grounded in civil rights and feminism. So tell me about again, how or why Nina made the list for you. And then how do you choose, if you choose, to engage in social commentary through your music? Well, she, I mean, she could be the whole list, you know? <laughs> she, I mean, she's kind of the OG of inspiration, you know, in terms of, we have a lot of parallels. Um, we actually share the same birthday. Um, 
you know, February 21st, obviously not the same year. And she's also from North Carolina. You know, she's from the country, part of, you know, part of North Carolina. And she was classically trained. And then she went into, you know, she had to shift, you know, and yeah. she had to because, you know, she didn't have a choice. I'd made a choice of shifting, right. but she pulled that with her yes. in, in ways that were really beautiful. And I'm glad she didn't end up doing classical piano because I think she's one of the best singers around. You know, mm-hmm. the way that she uses her voice is so incredible. And then she's got all that skill in her fingers and it's just like a deadly combination. But like people always like say to me, oh, like you put all this, all this different stuff on the same record. That, and I'm like, that's not new. That's not right. <laughs> like Nina been doing, Lena was doing that. She was like putting British folk songs. And Paul yes. Olsen was doing that next to a blues, next to a standard, yeah. next to... Like, yeah. none of this is new. Like, how, what? And, she, you know, just seeing, like, how she took an aria, that was very inspiring to me. Take something like Oh Black Swan, the Minotti aria, and, like, I was like, what? You yes. know, yes. so I, I was very inspired by that. And then also the fact that she is a, she is a an interpreter kind of mm-hmm. of the top. Like, she takes a song, and you don't even know who did it. That's right. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's, right. that's such right. a talent that's not, it's not put it's not held up these days everybody got to write everything and i'm uh, like no you don't actually in 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 the things that she wrote are incredible because she didn't write 1500 songs like she interpreted and then when she has something to say mm-hmm. she said it and for mm-hmm. women is like saying it it is like every experience of the black woman like encapsulated into one song it's just absolutely incredible i've never done it it's one of those, it's like strange fruit. I'm like, I feel like I got to have 10 more years. 10 more years. Okay. You know, it's just like, I, I don't know if I'll ever feel like I have I have the life experience to sing those songs. But she is inspiring to me in that I'm like, when I have something to say, I say it. So how I work that into my own music is when the voice wants to be heard, it comes out. And I just, I'm not trying to write a whole bunch of stuff. It's only when it's something important. And it's all come from slave narratives that I've read, you know, pieces of our history, like, you know, uh, uh, advertisements in the newspaper for people. That kind of stuff is what informs the songs that I write that are, I guess you could part, you could call part of my activism is giving a voice to the generations of black women who've had to do unbelievably difficult things, mm-hmm. just make it through the day. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm sitting up here in such a position of privilege. I, you know, had, you know, my childhood wasn't that bad, you know, like I went to right. school, my parents were like, you know, not, I mean, I had a, I had a lot of advantages, um, including not growing up with a whole lot of money, because I think that's an advantage actually, because you learn that you got to make it yourself, you know, and you're not handed. I, the things that I was handed were the good things, were the important things. They weren't the money, wasn't yeah. the, you know, it was like just life, life lessons. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, if I can, they went through it, right? The least yeah. I can do is read about it and talk about it and sing about it. It's the very, mm. very least that I can do with my privilege of cold, you know, pure running water and my children, I get to, I ain't got to worry about my children dying, getting taken, yeah. you know? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So it's just kind of like, I had this urge that I could not gainsay, mm. you know? And so when the songs came out, they just came out, yes. and, you know, and then I wrote them and, and I, I kind of say I shepherded them into existence. I don't even like, almost like, don't like put my name on them, even though I got, somebody's got to, I suppose. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because to you, it feels like it comes from somewhere else. It's bigger than you. I think that's what you're saying. Exactly. It's bigger than me, my own intellect, my own cap. I'm drawing on knowledge that I know not of. I'm drawing yes. on inspiration. I think that's what I'm gathering from. That. Yeah. Exactly. Well, listen, let me tell you something, Rhiannon. and this was just Amazing. I mean, you were co- just, I, I learned so much. I enjoy this. I'm sure our listeners will enjoy this, taking us down this historical path and journey with you and, and meshing that with your life story. Thank you. You are absolutely brilliant and talented and soulful and kind, and we're better because of you. 
So thank you for joining me today. And I mean that. I mean that. I, th I learned so much. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for your authenticity, for your transparency, and just for being kind. This was fun and informative, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Do you Absolutely. have any final thoughts that you would like to share with folks about your experience of being Black in America? Um, just to say that, you know, we all have to come to terms with what it means to us about being Black in America, because everybody else gonna have an opinion. Mm. Black, white, red, whatever. Everybody else gonna have an opinion about what our experience is. Mm. I have learned that I have to be okay with what my experience of being black in America is and that nobody can tell me what that is and what it isn't and yes. what I can listen to and what I can't listen to. Yes. Cause I'm, you know, I got the OG black instrument. The band, you know, you can try to tell me it's not, but I know, you know, so know. for me, knowledge is power. And it's like the more that we know about what we have gone through as a people, Yes. The more that we know about all the different levels and the layers and all of the complexities about what we've gone through as a people, the more that we can be accepting of everyone's experience of being black in America. Well said, my friend. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Family, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Now remember to hit the follow or subscribe button to see every episode when they come out. Until next time, keep on trucking, baby.